Welcome to In the Adirondack Library. The Adirondack Experience's new virtual book series featuring recently published books about the North Country. Thank you for joining us for the first program in the series, which will explore Adirondack life, history, and culture through the work of a diverse group of authors. I'm Jenny Ambrose, the museum's Director of Archives and Special Collections. The Adirondack Experience has a specialized regional library containing the largest, most comprehensive repository of books, periodicals, printed ephemera, photographs, manuscripts, maps, and government documents related to the history of the Adirondack region and the park. All of the books in the series will join thousands of other books about the Adirondacks lining our shelves. This season's In the Adirondack Library authors examine the lives and work of Adirondack photographers and sculptors, provide new insights into the role of the wilderness and camping in American culture, and illuminate the experiences of Black communities in the North Country. I hope you will join us every month on Monday evenings throughout the fall and winter for conversations with our authors. Books in the series are available in the museum's gift shop and at your local public library. A full schedule as well as information about the books and authors are available at our website, theadkx.org. The museum is delighted that Mitch Tyke, station manager of North Country Public Radio and host of Northwards, has agreed to conduct the author interviews for the series. His weekly show, Northwards, features conversations with people from around the North Country about what makes living here special and unique. Enjoy Mitch's thoughtful, engaging interviews during the museum's monthly Monday Night Books programs and in episodes of his podcast every Friday afternoon. This evening, it is my great pleasure to introduce Matt Delos, author of In the Adirondacks, Dispatches from the Largest Park in the Lower 48. His new book on the Adirondacks reflects many of the themes he explores in his work and research. Matt is a PhD candidate in history at Cornell University, where he teaches environmental writing seminars. His academic research investigates how histories of design, wildness, and spontaneous vegetation offer insights into American environmental thought. He also runs Thicket Workshop, a design firm but specializing in plant-focused ecological public and private landscapes. Matt sends the compelling and entertaining dispatches in his book from locations he visits on his rambles through the Adirondacks, taking us with him on an inquisitive journey through the most complicated and contested park in North America. He travels through bogs, lakes, forests, and the high peaks to great camps, cheap motels, campgrounds and souvenir shops, and into the lives of residents, tourists, and notable figures in Adirondack history. His book blends stories from the region's history, immersive travel writing, and Matt's personal observations to, to explore the significance of the Adirondacks within American culture and its influence on the way we think about the environment. This evening, Matt will read and discuss excerpts from his book with Mitch, we welcome questions from all of you for Matt about the book. Please submit your questions through the Q&A feature. We'll post links and other useful information in the chat section. Now we'll go to Matt to hear his first dispatch. To get there from any direction, go up. Higher than the valleys all around, the Adirondacks is a place set apart where boreal plants venture south to meet temperate, where the air is chill and the summer short, where there's a home garden center called Zone 3 and a theme park called the North Pole, where 1920s silent film directors shot Siberia, Alaska, and Switzerland. Up there, where the frontier held on until the 20th century, some people are convinced it still does and always will where one county the size of Rhode Island has zero traffic lights. Up there, where you can still see the stars, where the breeze is balsam and pine, where the sick went to take the fresh air cure. 
Not too far from cities booming with sooty industry and commerce in the 19th century, New York and Boston and Montreal, Philadelphia and Rochester and Albany, the Adirondacks was a convenient wilderness where the wealthy could go up to get away. Newport and Saratoga offered society and fashion. The Adirondacks offered an adventurous escape from such things. Even after society and fashion invaded and someone in sweltering New York City could hop onto a train at seven in the evening and disembark before dawn in the chill of the pines, the Adirondacks still felt remote. Despite automobiles and interstate highways and Lear jets, the Adirondacks still feels farther away than it actually is. I grew up in a gem of a limestone valley, a long day's drive south of the Adirondacks. That valley is all sunlight and sweet soil, a valley where you can toss carrot seeds out your sliding glass door and they'll sprout. Every August of my childhood, my parents and I took a vacation. We've drove south to Ocean City, Maryland to spend a week on the beach. Hot sand, sunburn, ocean views from the seventh floor of a mid-rise condo. We never considered driving up to the Adirondacks, but I knew the name. One of those iconic places leveraged for lifestyle marketing, places like Yellowstone, Denali, and Montana. Parcels of the American landscape elevated to the myth of what we think we want to be. Here's all I knew about the Adirondacks. It was up north, it was cold, it was wild. Wild with bears and wolves, wild with gloomy forests and pristine mountain peaks. When I heard a friend or a meteorologist or a passing stranger say the name, it always chirped with an enthusiasm not typically granted to place names. It always popped into my head with an exclamation point. The Adirondacks. A highway rest stop is where I first set foot there. Some college friends and I were on a road trip to a ski resort near Montreal. All day we'd been driving north through ice and rain. I was wedged in the back seat, but at least I had a window. We pulled over at the rest stop. I got out of the car, leaned forward to stretch my legs, interlaced my fingers behind me and arched my back. I didn't know where we were at first. Maybe a sign told me, maybe I saw a rack of brochures for theme parks and motels. Across the four lane highway, storm clouds crashed into pines and spruce and rocks. And I imagined those pines and spruce and rocks stacked unbroken for a hundred miles. It felt forbidding, gigantic, an enormous bounded object that seemed to have its own gravity, somehow distinct from the rest of the continent, as if the civilized realm had tried to smother the wild, but this feral bit had burst through. We all piled back into the car and sped north. I balled the sleeve of my sweatshirt into my fist and buffed a porthole in the frost on my window. I pressed my forehead against the icy glass to watch the Adirondacks slide by. The land seemed to harbor a secret, something mysterious, even unknowable. I couldn't shake it from my mind. A few years later, I got the chance to go back, finally, and then I went back again. And the more time I spent up there, the more I wanted to see it all. Even after I realized I never could, that no one could see all of the Adirondacks without going mad or broke or both, I still drove up again and again to try. Now, when I'm not in the Adirondacks, it looms massive up north, spruce dark and foggy. Up there, I see it choreographed like a stage show. Every neon motel sign hums, flickers, and snaps on, buzzing red in the evening pines. Every real estate agent pounds a sign that says waterfront into the rocky soil. Every pitcher plant snags a mosquito. Every beaver smacks its tail. Every porcupine chews on an outhouse door. Every canoeist paddles the perfect J-stroke. And on every pontoon boat, cans of Bud Light pitch in a cooler of melting ice. Wind cuts in from the west. Every red spruce leans, every sugar maple creaks, every tamarack sways. And in the last moment before dusk, every lake drops slack. Some unknown thousand silver flecks splayed across the great north woods going dark. For those of you who uh, joined in the middle of that, that's Matt DeLoss, author of In the Adirondacks, Dispatches from the Largest Park in the Lower 48. And that little excerpt, I, I, I hope that uh, many of you have had a chance to read this book. But if you haven't, I think that really ought to whet your appetite for the pages to come. It's uh, such a such a eloquent um, 
description. Um, Matt, thanks so much for setting the stage for our conversation and for being the inaugural guest in this uh, in this series. Thanks for being here with me. I appreciate it. Um, I'll remind people who are tuning into the live stream that you can join the conversation at any time throughout the event. Uh, by typing your questions into the Q&A here on Zoom. We'll try to work questions in throughout the hour, especially if you have questions that specifically relate to something we're talking about. And Matt, I want to start with a catalyst for this book. There, There is no shortage of written words about the Adirondack region. What were you hoping to do by bringing this collection of dispatches together that I guess either hadn't been done or or you hope to do in a different way? I think it started one day when I was walking through Old Forge and I'm I'm walking through Old Forge and, you know, there's an amusement park, there are motels, there are souvenir shops, there's kind of a high end furniture store, all of this, um, all of these various kind of um, businesses related to both locals and to tourists coming up to spend some time. And I'm walking along and of course there are also a number of real estate offices. And I'm walking past a real estate office and in the window of a real estate office, there's this large poster that's talking about an estate that's for sale. And it says something along the lines of purchase this mansion in the middle of 6 million acres of wilderness. And I kind of thought that's interesting, right? Like what, what is this moment that we have right now where People can still say that even though the Adirondacks is very obviously a place where people live and spend their lives. How does it still kind of have that connection to wilderness? And so that just kind of made me wonder what does this place mean to people and kind of how does that connect back to its history? And and what I wasn't seeing in the literature, while there there are so many amazing books written about the Adirondacks already, um, I wasn't seeing anything that was really taking our moment today and kind of offering a very kind of immersive experience in that, but also connecting back to history. Well, and and that you do it without necessarily putting a value judgment on the the Adirondacks as they exist as this sort of great contradiction is um, is really pretty remarkable um, because uh, you manage to embrace both the wild and and the much less wild. Yeah, what's interesting is to, I think the, to kind of get back to the literature, often I think that that wilderness or what is kind of seen as traditionally wild as kind of away from people is um, has been prioritized or you've kind of had small town kind of histories prioritized. And to me, what just kind of made me become obsessed about the Adirondacks was that it's all mixed together, that you have this all going on kind of not only in this kind of clumped together geography, but that it's also kind of occurring like on the land, right? That you can go outside of Old Forge, you can be in neon lights in Old Forge, and then in 10 minutes kind of be in a forever wild chunk of forest. It's just, there are so many different experiences like that. And I just wanted to kind of embrace that um, without kind of saying that one was better than the other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. My, My early days in reporting, I did some stories about the concept of gateway communities that exist right outside national parks, places like um, the, the, the Kanab, Utah, just outside uh, some of the big national parks in um, in southern Utah, and uh, Grand Canyon Village and those places. But they all exist on the fringes, where as the, the, the truth is, the gateway to the Adirondack Park is inside the Adirondack Park. Yeah, when are you really there, right? <laughs> well, and, and uh, you know, and I think that's an interesting point as well. Um, do you think the blue line itself sets the Adirondacks apart from other parks or uh, important parks around the country? I mean, it seems like the blue line has this kind of mythology around it. Yeah, it, it definitely does. I mean, I think what's interesting is that um, there is that line that's kind of in a way arbitrarily sort of set <laughs> there, right? It's kind of not necessarily something that you cross and really notice. I, maybe it's not that significant to people is is maybe a way to to think about that versus like a, a national park boundary. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think has historically set the Adirondacks apart in other ways from other parts of the country that also have this outdoors mystique, the, you know, places like the Rockies or the desert Southwest, because, you know, you could just as easily think of them as, as great wildernesses as great wildernesses as well. 
Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, the Adirondacks is certainly kind of one place among many in this kind of greater tradition of what it means to connect to the outdoors. Um, I mean, for me, it's that the Adirondacks has this proximity to a large percentage of the population being in kind of the Northeast. And I mean, to me, it's such a fascinating tale because it has had its ups and downs. It, it's been really popular. It's kind of been forgotten. It's been kind of um, rejuvenated in the sense of being considered more wilderness with the APA in the 1970s and 80s. It's um, It's gone through some moments, right? It's not necessarily something that we've sort of set aside and thought, that's just going to stay there and we're not really going to do anything to it. Things have been happening. It's been in change. It's um, mistakes have been made. Successes have happened. It, it makes it for me a little more of a dynamic story. Can you describe your process of discovery when it came to, to actually writing the book? Yeah. So most often I would just kind of roughly plan a trip. I would say I'm going to camp at Racket Lake, and then in two days, I'm going to end up in Keene Valley. And I would just kind of head out and wander around and kind of see what I saw. And I, I would get up really early in the morning and kind of be out there for sunrise. I would then maybe have a couple hours where I could go walk around the town and kind of talk to people. And maybe in the afternoon, I got to go for a hike up to a fire tower. And I think during this entire time, I was... Um, you know, I was moving, I was kind of going through towns, I was bumping into people and having short conversations with them. And I, I think that's kind of what sets sort of the, the structure and tone of the book is just that they're not separate, that they're always bumping into each other, that there's there's always more than one story kind of going on. What were the kinds of things that you talked with people about? You know, I would always, it, it kind of depends where, where I was, but I would often ask people what they thought of the park and kind of not... Um, not really telling them much about anything. And some people would say, what do you mean by the park? And right, it was very clear in some of these conversations that people had a sense that they were in Racket Lake, not necessarily within this wider park. And if people kind of bit into that idea, then I, I knew I could kind of push them a little bit further to get kind of more specific ideas about it. Um, and, you know, sometimes we would just talk about ice cream shops or souvenir <laughs> shops. It kind of depends on, on where we were. <laughs> We live in a in a time where you can easily sort of research yourself to death before you go on one of these kinds of trips. Did you have to guard against doing too much legwork before you got there in order to be you know better surprised or or take advantage of of serendipity? I try to not know too much. I mean, there's obviously I have to plan to some degree. I have to know kind of a rough idea of where I might stay, <laughs> but I didn't want to know everything. And, and I think that's actually kind of when I knew that my time for field work for this book was kind of up and I needed to sit down and start writing was when I, I would just kind of say, oh yeah, there's Racket Lake or, you know, there's that. When I started to get too good of a sense of, of the area, I realized that kind of that moment of trying to understand it had kind of passed and now I needed to actually start writing about it. Uh, well, and this is not too dissimilar from, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the earliest people to explore, um, you know, the earliest settlers to explore the area, certainly, um, although they probably did not find as many ice cream shops when they came to, uh, to, to research the place. Likely not. Yeah. Um, did you ever worry that doing this book putting it all together, taking all these trips and and composing what comprised this uh, book might turn out to be like Verplank Colvin's like life work, the, the man who spent years putting together a map that would never quite materialize? Yeah, absolutely. Is, is this a good chance to, to read a bit about Verplank Colvin? Yeah, I, I, I suspect uh, there might be some people... Uh, He's a name that's that's somewhat known, but uh, but share a little bit more about who Verplank Colvin was, and and uh, and then yeah, if you'd uh, be willing to read a, an excerpt from the section on him. Yeah, so Verplank Colvin was um, kind of the, I guess the, call him the lead surveyor of a, of a large group. At one point, it was kind of described as an army of people who were out there essentially trying to map the Adirondacks in the late nineteenth century, and um, he did kind of have this obsession that he needed to map all of the Adirondacks on one piece of paper in a way. At least that's kind of my read of, of his tale. And um, I mean, to me, it was somebody that I kind of kept bumping into. I, I kept reading about him in books. I would be out hiking in the middle of nowhere and I would kind of run into a monument that either was to him or had actually been made by one of his crews. 
Um, and I, I kept just running into these little bits of him. And he was, to me, very present on the landscape, even though he's obviously been dead for a very long time. Um, so here, let me jump into a, a little bit of an excerpt from this. This is a kind of a, a chapter that mingles together Colvin's story as well as sort of indigenous histories of, of the area. Um, so most locals and tourists today have never heard Colvin's name, but a great number mythologize him. That's why he's still around. They do it for a few reasons. The Adirondacks still looks a lot like the sketches and photographs and written descriptions that appeared in Colvin's reports. You can read Colvin's words and get the feeling that he's on an adventure in a forest you just walked through. The Adirondacks also at times gives the impression that it hasn't been mapped yet. And even if you're holding a map in your hands, the forest can feel unknown, which makes Colvin your colleague. You're both trying to figure the place out. Most importantly, Colvin was a flatlander obsessed with the Adirondacks. He wanted to see it all. His desire to see it all stuck to the land. It lingers, somehow, faint yet pervasive, almost as if it saturated bedrock, mixed inextricably with sand. In the 1990s, when a regional planning agency upgraded to a set of PCs that could crunch geographic information about the Adirondacks and possibly untangle its complexity, someone named one of the computers Colvin. Do you feel like in, in some ways you're a, a spiritual descendant of, uh, of Colvin? I, I think my approach was much more fragmentary than, than Colvin's. I mean, I, I definitely felt that of looking at maps and saying, hey, what's that lake over there? What, what does that look like? Maybe I should walk six hours to get there or go in a really long canoe paddle. But I, I feel like at times I had to kind of let, let that go, that realize maybe that that comprehensive approach to the land wasn't really the best way for me to understand the current moment of the park. And and that's, of course, one of the distinguishing characteristics of Colvin. The, the, he would not have just let that go. Mm -hmm, definitely. Who are some of the other important names or, or, or noteworthy names that you think people getting to know the Adirondacks ought to know or, or people who already know the Adirondacks might be overlooking? Hmm. We could also come back to that one. <laughs> yeah, let me think about that one for a little bit. That's a tough one. Uh, I mean, that's one of the things that's that's really remarkable about the uh, about this book is just how many people we we get to know through the history that you write about. Um, but I'm happy to 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 jump forward a little bit and um, talk a little bit about the the um, the Adirondack look, if you will. The, the particular juxtapositioning of, of lakes and, and trees and landscape, how would you describe what the Adirondack look is? Yeah, um, maybe it'd be good to again go to an excerpt here. Absolutely. I think I have a section that kind of addresses it. Give me two seconds to pull it up here. And so this kind of gets back to the blue line a little bit too. So maybe we can kind of bring that conversation about, about that, that division. So let me, let me start it right, right here. Wooden signs cut to the shape of the blue line mark where the blue line strikes most main roads. I've never seen a family posed in front of one for a photograph, a common scene at national parks. Tires don't wear ruts in the roadside grass. A physical blue line would make arrival an event, would create a threshold. Before 1970, often there wasn't even a sign to tell you that you had arrived. A good reminder that an absolute bounded sense of Adirondack geography is a tale of the past 50 years. It's no great divide, the blue line. And more often than not, the first thing I saw after crossing it was another tree of the same species I had just seen on the other side. In fact, the blue line encloses quite a bit that doesn't even look like the Adirondacks. An oblong core of rolling mountains and lakes with pine studded shores best matches the Adirondack scenic ideal. The scenic core is approximately coterminous with the first blue line. I wonder if New York got it right the first time and then took it too far. On calendars and postcards, this area defines the Adirondack look. The rest tags along. That Adirondack look, its tall pines that lean at just the right angle, a serrated line of spruce, rusty pine needles carpeting the ground, boulders with medallions of lichen. There's a lake nearby with calm dark water and at least one shield of rock that slopes to the shore. 
rolling blue ridges stack into the distance. And I think even if you've never been to the Adirondacks, and I dare say that uh, that our uh, everyone tuning in today probably has <laughs> some some rich connection to the Adirondacks, whether whether you live here or whether this is a place that you spend your summers or it's just a special place. I think I think we all picture there's a certain Adir that that certain Adirondack look that you describe as as if not uniquely Adirondack, certainly distinctly Adirondack. Um, we had we a suggest apply it more broadly, maybe than we should sometimes, and it tends to kind of shift. I think some lakes that kind of don't look like the Adirondacks actually do when it's foggy. I, I talk about this further in the book, but yeah. right, those things shift. And sometimes when you're driving up to the Adirondacks, um, something looks like it, but then when you're driving back down, you realize that it doesn't really actually look that much, <laughs> right? So it's as much as a kind of physical distinction as it is a, a kind of mental one within each person. Well, and, and you mentioned driving, and that's something significant as well. You've actually described this book as as kind of a driving book. In a way, I, I feel like I actually ended up spending a lot of time in the car looking around. And um, that was maybe another point that I, I kind of wanted to highlight in this book is that that is kind of the way that a lot of people see the park today. And yet I feel like it's often as kind of an experience kind of limited in a lot of Adirondack literature. Um, so this is probably another good chance to um, turn to an excerpt here where I talk about roads. So this is in a chapter that talks about the large chunks of forest that still remain. So despite these chunks of forest, the roadside is the most frequently viewed landscape in the Adirondacks, a long double yellow line that curls and drops and climbs through the forest. Asphalt, white line, gravel berm, a strip of grass and milkweed and goldenrod, maybe a big rock. Darting from town to town or just passing through, most tourists don't see much else. At 60 miles per hour, at least 75 if you're a local. The forest that fronts the roadside is a long windshield blur, green, green, and more green. It's easy to forget that beyond the blur, there's often a forest that could absorb a week of walking. Driving Adirondack roads, I like to think I'm on the bottom of a canyon sliced deep and slender through a broad leafy plateau. The forest beyond my windshield blur pushes back with an intractable heft, the forest pushes back on both sides like thick stone. And there I am, down deep in the guts, strata to my flanks, hands at 10 and 2, leaning over my steering wheel and looking up to try to see the sky. And maybe rolling down your windows and being able to take in that Adirondack smell that is also distinctive about this place. Definitely, especially on a summer evening after a rainstorm, right? I think that's probably something that a lot of people can connect to. Uh, well, and and I guess the other thing about its accessibility by car is that that really sets it apart from uh, many other, you know, uh, significant wilderness areas uh, in places like Yellowstone or Yosemite, where um, the roads are very consciously defined and you know, you can only access really very certain parts of uh, of those parks by car, whereas roads traverse, you know, almost not every inch, but but so much of uh, of the Adirondacks and um, make them that much more accessible, uh, but also possibly that much less wild. Yeah, and it's interesting, right, to have have this place that has this cultural image of of wilderness so strongly attached to it. So you can do something such as drive three or four hours north to get to the Adirondacks and pull into a campground that's obviously a very controlled space and walk down to the shore of a lake at dusk and hear a loon call. And in many ways, unless you're kind of a purist of the experience of wilderness, this is this very wild moment that you can have that that seems to be very accessible. And Right. It's it's partially about the what you're looking at and kind of what you're experiencing, but it's also about the idea. Right. It's um, as I mentioned in the excerpt I read at the beginning, it, in my mind, the Adirondacks always pops out with an exclamation point. And that's part of that arrival. That, that's why it has kind of this this wildness attached to it, because it is exciting. It is this idea that's kind of beyond your immediate experience.
we're talking about some of the significant people or or significant people that maybe others haven't heard as much about you describe uh barbara mcmartin as uh, as your adirondack guide who is barbara mcmartin yeah. um so barbara mcmartin and i'm not going to attempt to um on the fly give a, a comprehensive biography but um this is actually when i was thinking about your question this is definitely who i i was going to turn to later um so most significantly to me, she wrote an entire series of guidebooks for the park that covered, I don't think it covered the entire park, but vast areas. And she would go out and hike hundreds of miles a year and then write about these trails. And I, I think when I was learning the area, these guidebooks were just really significant to me to just know that there had been this person out there who kind of had this drive to know this area so well and to then kind of share it. And it really got to the point that I didn't even really like the new copies that they were printing. I liked going to used bookstores or finding something used online. And I would find a copy of one of her guides and, you know, it would just be destroyed. It would be muddy. The pages would be all wrinkled. Clearly it had been dropped in a bog at one point. And like, right. This was a book that somebody kind of got attached to and kind of used it as a way to get out into the woods. And I think those are just really significant. And, you know, she had this really great idea of that we couldn't just protect these remote wild areas. We needed to kind of immerse people in the experience of the Adirondacks on their terms. So often that meant kind of short hikes from from cars. Right. And and I think it's a really significant idea. Right. I mean, it's so easy to drive through the Adirondacks today and maybe not even see it <laughs> in a way if you're not familiar with it. Right. It's just a couple forests. It's just green like the rest of the east. But. I think if you were able to get out there and kind of experience a bog, if you were able to get out there and understand an old growth red spruce forest, I mean, there, there's a way to kind of create those attachments to the land through those just little moments of of experience. How significant do you think the forever wild mantra is in, in shaping both the past and the present of the Adirondack Park? It's an interesting one to me, the forever wild. I think I think in some ways for a lot of people, it's become so attached to the idea of wilderness that it's kind of lost some of its original meaning, right? I mean, the idea of it as being wilderness is kind of a, a later later attachment to it, right? That, that really comes in the 20th century. And um, to me, it's this much more interesting category of kind of like, what does it mean to sort of leave the land alone functionally, right? To me, yeah. I, I would say that for most people, a gravel road through a property kind of dismisses it as a wilderness. But I think in some ways you can go to places like the Moose River Plains and kind of have this very wild experience on forever wild land that's not necessarily designated a wilderness area. I mean, I think to me it allows for a much more complicated sense of of kind of how we intervene on the land, how we protect it, how we think about it as being wild. Um, this I think is there's the, a lot of potential in it. Maybe that's a good way to put it. There, and 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 there's this distinction you're making here between the idea of being wild and and being a wilderness. And and you know the irony, of course, is that is that a wilderness is also kind of a man-made construct. Absolutely right. It's it's a policy that we kind of impose, and that's how we keep people out. And yeah. why would you contend it's important for people in the rest of the country, even people who might not necessarily know the Adirondacks as something besides a, a spot on a map? Why is it important to consider the examples of the Adirondack Park today within the context of all the all the other natural places in the United States? Yeah, I think um, I think it's interesting that it's seen as kind of exceptional. I think there's a whole Adirondack literature that kind of says, you know, this is a great example of how we might protect areas, right? We take, we set a boundary that has 6 million acres and we kind of have communities, we have protected areas, we have working forests, we have souvenir shops, ice cream stands, also very remote wild wilderness areas, right? Um, so it's this much more kind of complicated entanglement of kind of ways to use the land and kind of appreciate the land and kind of cherish it and protect it. And I mean, to me, I think it's it's really interesting. And again, I go into this a little bit more in the book. What if it wasn't exceptional? So we think of it as being this exceptional example of kind of American preservation, conservation, however you want to label it. But what if we had one in other major areas of the country? What if there was one in Iowa? What if there was one kind of in Minnesota, right? What would it mean to kind of, instead of defining either the land as sort of used and developed or wilderness, what if we had this area that was sort of very complicated and in between? 
And I think there's a lot to learn from there. And clearly a lot of Adirondack literature has kind of addressed this. I just think that idea itself deserves a, a lot more attention. Well, and and it sort of makes the case for for the Adirondacks being neither black and white, but a but a big shade of gray in the or you know a big shade of gray with a blue line around it. Yeah, and an, an increasingly um, ecologically and culturally troubled world. I'm I'm wondering if that complexity is actually really an opportunity. <laughs> And I want to remind folks that uh, that you can take part in this conversation. We'd love to take your questions. Uh, feel free to drop them into the Q and A uh, feature in uh, on your screen, and uh, we'll weave them in over the next uh, twenty twenty five minutes or so. Um, but let me ask you this: um, How does this work, the the work that went into putting this book together, fit in in the context of the rest of your life's work? How do how do the Adirondacks influence? everything else you do? Good question. I'm not sure I have an easy answer to that one. <laughs> you know, I, I would I would probably say that the other work I do, which is kind of academic research, um, which is more kind of focused on the history of, of gardens and kind of how people have intervened in kind of close to home wildness, like their backyards or, or local preserves, um, as well as the work I do designing with um, plants, which is essentially kind of landscape design. Um, it all kind of comes back to uh, a fascination with landscape and kind of the various ways that we modify the land and kind of the cultural value that that ends up having. I mean, if, if you kind of think about the Adirondacks from a, a more remote position, not kind of in the details, really, it's kind of an example of that, of how do we intervene and how do we kind of interact with this place? And in a way, that's kind of what grounds a lot of my work. What would you? Who who do you hope is is reading this book? Um, and and what do you hope that they get from the experience? I think there could be a number of audiences for this book that would hopefully take something away. I, I think ideally, I was writing this book to somebody who didn't know all that much about the Adirondacks, and that that's why I, I think early on in the book, I kind of deliberately try to step back and try to appreciate this idea of the Adirondacks and kind of question what it is and why we're attached to it and kind of what it means today and in the past. But I'd also like to think that somebody who has spent a lot of time in the Adirondacks um, might really appreciate the details of the book and some of the new perspectives that I've kind of offered on places. I mean, it's certainly not only a wilderness ramble. It's certainly not only a local history of towns. It's, again, a way of kind of getting that perspective and kind of seeing what this place is. And so I, I hope even somebody who was very familiar with, say, Racket Lake history, um, probably much more so than I ever will be, would still kind of get something from this book by kind of seeing that wider perspective. As, as I read the as I read the book, I, you know, obviously this is not a guidebook in the way that um, in the way that we were talking about um Barbara McMartin's book. So, you know, it's less likely that uh, someone's going to find this in a used bookstore in 20 years with mm. with mud all over it or, or you know, um, grass stains, maybe coffee mm -hmm. stains. But uh, but awesome. it occurred to me that this is exactly the kind of book that would be great to to wind down with on the porch of your cabin or uh, in your tent after after a day spent in the Adirondacks to kind of reflect on um, on the experience that you've had and put it in the context of what what you wrote about. Yeah, definitely. I think it's um, I think anywhere, anytime you travel anywhere, it's so, so easy to get caught up in kind of the immediacy of what you're seeing and experiencing. And I, I think to be able to go to the Adirondacks and read a book that tries to sort of shift you out of that mindset could actually be a, a pretty interesting experience. I, I would argue it's also valuable to read when you're outside of the Adirondacks, just because in a way it's sort of <laughs> takes you to that moment, right? It's 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 a way to kind of get a sense of it without necessarily being there. And, and the irony is that both of us are uh, in this conversation are are speaking from outside the blue line. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, the other area that, that strikes me uh, that we really ought to talk a little bit about in, in the context of contradictions um, you actually touched a little bit on um, at the outset um, places like Old Forge and Lake George and and mm -hmm. some other places which are inside the Adirondack Park but are very much a different Adirondack 
experience than Racket Lake or or even you know North Creek or or you know the the smaller kind of more out of the way places. But why do you think it's important for those places to uh, to be part of the Adirondack experience as well? Yeah, I think to get back to that um, earlier when I had mentioned that I had seen that real estate ad for 6 million acres of wilderness. How boring would the Adirondacks be if it were 6 million acres of wilderness? I suppose it would be incredibly ecologically valuable and there would be a lot more kind of intact habitats there and in, in that area but it, to me it wouldn't really have the same significance it, it would be much more about kind of setting it aside and kind of just treating it like this object up on a shelf rather than this place that's very lived in that's um again like i mentioned the idea of mistakes i i think it's really fascinating to just be able to go up there and see where things didn't go right and in some people's minds, maybe Lake George is one of those places. It's not how I personally feel, but I could see that perspective. And I mean, maybe sometimes people drive by large mansions and think that that's a mistake. But again, I think it's it's more complicated than that. And I, I just think that value of being able to put that all into conversation is what, what really matters. And plus, how amazing to be able to drive transects and kind of go through a town that has these neon lights and then dive back into this this largely intact forest. It's um, and, and within just a very short time, too. Definitely. Uh, we have a question, uh, a very good question from uh, from Kay, who asks, um, how did you experience the high peaks? It's not really lake oriented and many peaks are some distance from the road. Um, yeah, I. Um, so there's a chapter in the book about the high peaks. And so I. It was very different, and I think I had a hard time kind of figuring out how to reconcile those two different ideas. I think especially because um, a lot of kind of the earlier ideas of the Adirondacks are kind of, to me, more focused on on that that lake country, um, and especially because the high peaks has become so very overcrowded. Um, it's almost in a way um, sort of dominated the way the popular image of the Adirondacks. I actually don't know this for sure. But I'm assuming that if I went and Googled Adirondacks, what would come up in an image search would probably be a picture of the high peaks. I mean, I think the um, the usage, usage statistics probably would say that the high peaks are incredibly popular and kind of dominate that, that conversation. So yeah, I went there. I parked in the parking lots. I um, got up at four in the morning to make sure I got a parking spot. I went out there on busy summer holiday weekends when I was basically walking in a line to get up a peak. I went out there at the end of October when I thought it was going to be icy and snowy and there were only seven cars in the parking lot. I mean, I think my way of kind of engaging with the high peaks was to sort of have some perspective on what was going on there. How does this idea kind of relate to the larger sense of the Adirondacks? How does it kind of fit into this kind of American history of, of recreation and, and wilderness? And it has become a little bit of a different story, I think. It, it is there. It's the high, the high peaks wilderness. It is kind of set apart. It's not a used area. It's, um, it's very different. So it, it is kind of in a way awkwardly attached to the rest of it. But I, I do try to keep some perspective on that and kind of mention that. Uh, well, and and it brings to mind this uh, this really nice quote that's uh, kind of a recurrent quote in your book. Um, uh, or at least a recurrent quote in the second chapter, and you, where you write, some say the Adirondacks uh, is ruined, trampled, overbooked, civilized, Arcadian days gone for good. Every summer, newcomers show up giddy at the gates of a wilderness untouched. Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, right. It's I, th I think you take a historical look at the Adirondacks and. There's this sense that look at this amazing place that we discovered, and then other people kind of show up, and then those original kind of people who found it kind of say that it's ruined, and this kind of happens over and over again, right? And I, I think the idea I'm kind of poking fun at myself because I showed up obviously within the last ten years and thought, wow, this place is great, and um, other people are probably thinking that it was ruined in 1985, and. Um, <laughs> It's just interesting to trace how people respond to such places over time. But and that is enthusiasm that? is encouraging, right? To kind of be <laughs> able to, I think in a world that we kind of live with a lot of scars and a lot of damage, to kind of find a place that somebody kind of finds that enthusiasm is significant, even though it is 
not the best if we're kind of trending down in, in some ways. What What is that classic uh, quote from Yogi Berra? Uh, that place is so popular, no one goes there anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pretty much like that, yeah. Um, we have another question from uh, from a member of our audience. Ellen writes, thank you for this great conversation. Thank you for those kind words, Ellen. Um, might I ask if your approach to the study of history has been impacted or changed by this particular project? I would say in many ways, this project sort of displays a lot of my thinking about how I approach history in that it, it's kind of a hybrid. So there are definitely parts of this that are historical, where I think I'm almost doing cultural history, where I'm thinking through what does this idea of the Adirondacks mean in kind of American culture in a certain moment? Um, but then kind of hybridizing that with more kind of narrative nonfiction, with kind of more um, scene-based writing that's set in the contemporary moment. And I, I think in writing history, I'm, in many cases, not all cases, but I'm really interested in how you can kind of experiment with those two approaches. And what does it kind of mean to, on one page, kind of describe, say, a neon sign turning on in the evening above a lake, but then also kind of dig into a, a cultural history of tourism? What does it mean to kind of have those two different types of writing next to each other? I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to kind of engage with a, a broad audience and to kind of um, tell complicated stories in a way that's entertaining and appealing. I feel like I should ask this question, this question, you know, our conversation is part of a series called uh, in the Adirondack library, and um, we shouldn't let the opportunity to go without mentioning the fact that you did spend a fair amount of time I gather at the Adirondack experience library doing research for this book. I did, and they were always very welcoming. And I think one of my favorite stories in um, kind of doing the research for this book is when I'm first kind of getting my sense of the region, when I don't really know what it is I want to pursue here, I um, either called or emailed, I forget, the, the museum and said, hey, could I come visit your collection, just kind of look around. And so I show up, I think it was in the off season, and I go to the desk and they give me directions to get to the library. And basically the gist of the directions was go to this building and look for the giant moose head. And to me, that was just so very fitting that, that this archive of, of basically Adirondack history and kind of everything that everybody's written about the Adirondacks sits behind a wall where there's a giant moose head. And to me, it was just this very significant moment of getting to do that and just like walk under this moose head and go to the, the room. Uh, but yes, I spent so much time there and um, I think often found myself incredibly distracted there in that I... It's, it's a fairly short book in that it, it's under 200 pages and deliberately so, right? It's meant to be kind of not introductory, but it's meant to be a, not to be a 400 page kind of local history. And I, I kept finding these interesting stories that I just wanted to follow that I would end up writing 20 pages about. And I just had to kind of end up not including them. I, I feel like I have three or four more books kind of sitting, <laughs> sitting in my notes that I could possibly write that I had pulled from that archive. Uh, and and this must be an issue for for anyone who who writes a book like this. How did you walk the line between having the experiences that you had, you know, being able to absorb them, but also being able to to credibly you know, recreate them for this book, you know, without like taking a trail um, through the high peaks and then stopping every you know thirty feet to write in your notebook. I feel like that's mostly what I did was <laughs> walk 30 feet and take a note in my notebook. I think I struggled with that of how do you, how do you distill such a geographically, culturally and ecologically significant region into a lively, entertaining book that's not 1200 pages long? Um, yeah, I think it, it was kind of examples. It was kind of relying on certain stories that could kind of carry the weight of of larger ideas rather than getting into the specifics. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was just me kind of either driving, paddling, or walking around the woods, sort of making notes in my notebook. I, I think I have a stack that's about that high of just field books of just every detail I could possibly think of. 
It's kind of a romantic image, though, the, uh, the you know, the writer, you know, tramping through the woods and, and stopping and writing things in his notebook and, and going on another 30, you know, 30 feet and then writing some more. It's, uh, it's kind of kind of the way a lot of us might like to write a book. Not in black fly season <laughs> and not necessarily when you're walking through a mini golf course. People kind of give you strange looks, right? <laughs> I wasn't always in the wilderness. And so so in those more um, developed areas, I definitely got some funny looks. Yeah. Uh, we have another question and uh, a reminder, we have you know a few more minutes so we can take uh, uh, maybe a handful more questions if you have them. Linda would like to know um, the pressure of development that comprises the ecological integrity of um, the Adirondacks is constrained by APA regulation. Do you think there's any other way to keep the ecology of the region intact besides regulation? That is definitely a doozy of a question. And um, I feel like we could have an entire presentation and discussion on, on just that question alone. It's it's a great one. Um, I, I think for me, the immediate place I have to go is what is going to live within the blue line 250 years from now? Um, I, I think on a, on a warming planet that's certainly facing some um, major problems with species migration, what exactly is going to be growing here. I mean, let's just kind of limit it to trees. Like what happens in a couple centuries if oaks, say, are the dominant species in the forest? I mean, I think it it changes really this Adirondack ecology completely in a way. And um, to me, I'm really fascinated by that. I mean, how does that change our attachment to this region if there aren't necessarily the same kinds of bogs? What does it mean if there aren't as many evergreens? What does it mean if the species that um, of deciduous trees that grow there aren't as brilliant in the fall. I I kind of worry that the very kind of foundation of the Adirondacks is kind of this cultural obsession might be at risk. And if that's at risk, what does that then do to the actual protection of the species that live there? It, it seems like it's kind of problematic. Um, well, and, and it seems like that is interesting. Oh, sorry, man. I was just going to say that seems like a question worth weighing. Um, if indeed we look at the Adirondacks as a potential model for how both uh, wilderness and and civilization can coexist, if we were going to take the the Adirondack Park as a model and yeah. you know insert it into uh, to Northeast Iowa, for example. Right, and maybe it's worthwhile. You had mentioned um, Forever Wild and kind of what that means, and I think. In a lot of environmental thought in the 20th, at least in the late 20th century, for something to be wild or for something to be wilderness meant to leave it alone, right? It meant to not intervene. And that's changed with kind of the development of ecological restoration um, since the, the 70s. But that kind of brings up this question of if this area, if we want to preserve kind of these species and these ecosystems that are in the area, are we willing to kind of allow ecological restoration to take place on forever wild land? Can we embrace a place that is both wild and that we've cultivated? It's um, a pretty significant question and I'm not sure, um, I mean, based on how contentious issues have become in the Adirondacks that are much less significant, it, it seems like it would be a hard one to resolve. Uh, we have another question. This is uh, from Thomas, who's joining us from Bethesda, Maryland, uh, this evening, um, not far from uh, from my old stomping grounds. Uh, he wants to know, um, do you think the Department of Environmental Conservation is too restrictive on development for local residents and landowners? Uh, he says he's detected a fair amount of resentment from the local residents towards the DEC. Hmm. So maybe I'm not, I'm certainly not an expert on kind of regional planning or what the DEC does and what the APA does. Um, I would say that both, I, I get, I go into this in the book a little in, in more depth, but when both the people who want more wilderness areas and the people who want more development are both unhappy, maybe we've struck some kind of balance there. Maybe that's <laughs> a pretty good place to be. And I, I mean, from what I've read, there are definitely significant instances of locals feeling like they were wronged by regulations that basically allowed them to not do with what their land, what they wanted to do with it. Um, but I, I don't know how you kind of reconcile that with this larger history and story of what it means to protect this region. It's it's definitely complicated. And maybe that goes back to that idea of of seeing it as a, a wilderness. If, if we see it as a six million acre wilderness, then 
maybe we're not willing to embrace that condo development in a town, but if we're willing to see it as a more complicated place, maybe there's a little bit of flexibility there, protection and a little bit of development. That's probably risky to go down that path. But. <laughs> well, it, 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 the the phrase that comes to mind as you're talking is you know, sort of the Adirondacks as necessarily messy. Mm -hmm. that's, sort of the, that's sort of their nature. Yeah, and lean into that, right, in, in a way. Maybe, maybe that's a good yeah. path forward. Uh, we have just a couple more minutes. I, I guess I'll uh, look to see if uh, we have any more questions. Um, and if we don't, um, I have one more question for you. And that is, um, since you finished writing this book and it's been out in the world, um, what are the places in the Adirondacks that you most like to come back to that now you don't have to, you're not assigned to write about? I um, I have developed a particular fondness for the area around Upper Saranac Lake in the St. Regis Canoe area. Um, as again, just this kind of, um, to me, really fascinating um, area, both kind of ecologically, but also historically, right? This area of such great wealth that um, has obviously now, I mean, the, the, the very large estates have kind of been chopped up. The, the hotels are no longer there. They've kind of been divided into smaller homes. Um, and yet right next to the St. Regis Canoe area that's kind of set aside as this area for motorless waters. Um, I just think it's a really fascinating kind of sub-region of, of the park. Um, but I have to say that I go any chance I can to anywhere. I, I feel like I have enough distance from the book now that I kind of, in a way, get to experience it all over again. So it's, it's still pretty exciting to go up there. And uh, favorite ice cream place in the park? Favorite ice cream place in the park? I'd have to say Donnelly's. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a lot of people's favorite in the park. I believe the term de rigueur is the uh, right one uh, for that. <laughs> Can you beat the view at that place too? It's, no, it's you good. cannot. <laughs> um, especially if you've been driving through Lake Country all day and you get to the open fields all of a sudden. It's a pretty good view. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Matt Delos, it is a terrific book and uh, just a just a wonderful conversation to have about it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn things back over to uh, to Jenny Ambrose at this point. Thanks so much, Mitch. So thank you for joining us for In the Adirondack Library. If you would like to hear more conversation between Matt and Mitch, a previous interview about the book is available on North Country Public Radio's website. We invite you to come back on October 2nd when we will discuss the next book in the series, American Vistas, The Life and Art of John Van Alstine. The author, award-winning journalist Tim Kaine, and the artist John Van Alstine will both be on hand to discuss John's remarkable career as a sculptor. To register, follow the link in chat or visit the ADKH, the ADKX website. A reminder, the full schedule for our monthly programs and information about the books and authors is available on our website. We'll see you next month.